Welcome back. I must apologise for my tardiness in publishing this video. I had issues with audio video desynchronisation which I think I've isolated and solved. This is the full Skype interview with Robert Parker. It is unedited with the exception of some audio removed, breathing, and a brief phone interruption. Robert brings to the interview some graphs from a nuclear power implementation model that he and Robert Barr have been developing. If you would like more information, please visit Robert Parker's blog at www.nuclear4climate.com. Link in the description. Apart from that, thanks for your patience and enjoy the video. Nuclear power has not been instigated in Australia. In fact, Australia is the only nation in the top 20 OECD countries that does not consume nuclear-generated electricity. The Australian Nuclear Association has been a proponent for the adoption of the technology since its inception in 1983. This episode's guest is the former President and current Vice President of the ANA. Robert Parker, welcome to Going Fishing. Good afternoon. Thanks for the invitation for this uh, video. It's a great initiative you've undertaken, Logan, and I look forward to helping you out with it. Thank you very much, and thanks to you for, a, uh, for helping me a, um, with this endeavour. All right, so first question. We'll start with your career prior to nuclear. You've uh, been a project manager with some big names in the construction industry and the mining industry. Could you briefly give us a description of, of your career history? Yes. <clears throat> Basically, I spent most of my working life as a site project engineer and project manager on large civil engineering infra infrastructure jobs in Australia and internationally. For example, large urban tollways, power station projects, uh, railway, roadworks, and uh, internationally, I was involved with some of the world's largest hydropower projects on the, in the Mekong River and Da River areas of Vietnam. So uh, I've been fortunate in having civil engineering take me right around the globe. Um, more recently, after a lot of site work, I got involved in the technical and economic evaluation of major projects. So that's consumed a fair bit of my time over the last 10 or so years. But uh, that was all capped off with the work I've now been doing in looking at nuclear energy to address climate change in our Australian environment. Excellent. So I, um, before we get sort of too deep into the, uh, um, into the nuclear thing, I was actually interested looking into your career with, the, um, with dams and you were talking about your development and construction of, of roller compacted concrete dams, which have been a large part of your career. Could you tell us a bit about those? Yeah. <clears throat> Traditionally, and if you look at most of the dams, for example, we've got in the uh, snowy area, they were clay cored rock fill or mass rock fill dams, various forms like that. Um, going in parallel with that, we had the very large uh, concrete gravity dams, uh, like the dams around Sydney catchment area, and we had large arch dams, like Hoover Dam, for example, in the United States, is a notable one. Now, dams got pretty expensive, and so what we tried to do is achieve the reliability and robustness of mass concrete dams, which were traditionally formed up and poured with wet concrete, and we introduced earthworks technology into building concrete dams. So uh, roller compacted concrete dams are what they say, what they actually, uh, in the name, they, we mix concrete, but it's very dry. We place it with a bulldozer between formwork and we roll it, compact it with large road going type rollers. This gives terrific uh, productivity improvements, makes the mass concrete cheaper. It's very strong and we get very reliable dams that way. We've got a few in Australia, but uh, the largest of them are in places like the Three Gorges in China and a lot of the ones we see now in Vietnam and Laos and places like that. The Three Gorges Dam, that's, if I remember correctly, is that the largest hydro power dam, dam in the, in the world. world? It's a massive, yeah. massive operation massive there. Dam. Yeah. yeah, sweet. And I, I, I worked on 
quite a number of, of those dams. And it was an it, it's always interesting to be at the forefront of a technology. It was quite exciting. But uh, what uh, I always saw in working on these dams, and I, I worked on ones in Indonesia and Southeast Asia and also in places as remote as Eritrea and Africa and uh, even in Iran, um, wherever I went, I saw that the actual water flows in catchments were declining. The world has been going through a progressively drying period and I became concerned about this um, and the impact of man's uh, anthropogenic uh, induced climate change. Uh, I, I really got a, quite a hint that it was occurring internationally from the projects I was working on. Wow. I also have a, a pretty firm opinion that dams are, um, are not to be built in areas uh, where a lot of people rely on the waterways. They are, they have considerable problems in terms of their environmental impacts and people tend to forget that when they advocate them. They're, they are of a concern. Uh, particularly the ones in tropical areas, like we've got in Asia, where they've got very high methane emissions. And in fact, some of the very large tropical dams, their methane emissions rival the climate change impacts of thermal coal power stations. What? There's a very does, big question mark. Where does methane come from a, high, from, a, from a dam? It comes from the degradation of the organic matter that sits in the topsoil. Uh, when you impound the reservoir, all of that organic matter, particularly in tropical regions, decays and that produces through an aerobic action, it produces bubbling methane. And over the years, as the reservoir fills with more organic matter from upstream, that material continues to decay within the reservoirs. And so this Methane is generally liberated out of the turbines and it gives off within the reservoir as well. It gives off quite a strong amount of methane to the atmosphere. Now, methane is a very strong greenhouse gas. Many people think it's 23 times stronger that than uh, carbon dioxide. Well, that, it is 23 times wow. stronger over 100 years, but over a 20-year period, it gets up to be about 100 times more potent than climate than carbon dioxide. And uh, I would think that over it's over those two and three decadal periods, over a resource that continues to emit uh, methane, that we ought to be worrying about the shorter term rather than the longer term impacts of methane. So it's a real concern on, wow. on large dams. Wow, well, I've learned something today, if nothing else. Yeah. That's crazy. Uh, all right. So next question. Look, you finished your civil bachelor's way back in 1989, and you completed your master's in nuclear science in 2014. So how does a civil engineering project manager with 25 years' experience building dams and other large bits of infrastructure get drawn down the nuclear rabbit hole? Okay. So as I said, working in Asia as I was uh, on large dams, and one day at a place called Eidsvold in Queensland. I was building a, a whole instrumental with others in building a, a weir on, on the river at Eidsvold. And uh, I was driving onto the site one day and I thought, you know, you keep hearing about climate change. You keep, it, it is a growing impact. Uh, it's about time you got involved in this as an issue. And so in my area in the Southern Highlands, I with others started a climate change group, an awareness group. This goes back to about 2005, I guess. And uh, we got underway with that. Now, um, that drew in a lot of people who were considering things such as renewable energy and those sorts of measures to deal with it. Um, my engineer's hat told me very early on that nuclear may actually be the way to go. That was reinforced by one of the world's greatest uh, and most knowledgeable people on climate change was Dr. James Hansen from the United States um, at Columbia University. And he was also a director of the Goddard Space Institute at NASA. 
Now, <clears throat> going back into that same period, I got in touch with James Hansen and I with the St. James Essex Centre in Sydney, uh, Adelaide University and Sydney University. We funded him to come to Australia and we filled the Melbourne Town Hall with a talk that he gave and a debate around climate change. We filled a number of halls around Sydney and uh, uh, we had quite a good strong tour. And it was James Hansen's opinion on the essential nature of nuclear energy to address climate change, along with a lot of other key thinkers on how we address climate change who are advocating for the use of nuclear energy to be the solution to it, or at least be centre stage in the way in which we address the issue. So it was with that inspiration that um, I started to advocate for nuclear, but very quickly realised that, uh, if you like, a grand scheme of, of quality assurance to make sure I wasn't deluding myself, told I'd better go and find out something about this stuff. Uh, at that time, the only place in Australia where you could even do a course that remotely resembled something on nuclear engineering was a nuclear science course at the Australian National University. And so I went off and did that course, a master's there in nuclear science so that I could more fully understand the risks of nuclear energy, the issues that give rise to radiation, its impact upon people, and also the elements of how you go about powering a nuclear reactor and what the process is all about. So that in a nutshell is why I went down that route. Um, having done that, I also joined the Australian Nuclear Association to find even more experienced people from whom I could draw some inspiration on these lines. And I did that and joined the ANA and shortly thereafter uh, I guess because of my keenness for public advocacy, I was asked to become the president, where I was for three years, the president of that institute. Excellent. So it's, it's been a, a long, a long tour, all the way, checking, uh, being cautious about the technology to understand it, um, and also ultimately going up to Fukushima, where I walked around Fukushima province. Uh, with my Geiger counter to look at the impacts of the Fukushima incident upon the province of Fukushima. Always trying to go to the source of the issues, understand and comprehend the full gamut of what we're seeing. Yeah, full on. Um, cool. So, well, okay, so you were the president of the Australian Nuclear Association for three years. Would you tell us a bit more about um, the association and what it does? Okay, the Australian Nuclear Association is a voluntary organisation. It only contains uh, individuals as members. It derives no money for any corporation. So it's, we've got about 120, 140 members at this stage. Uh, and at present, it's undergoing a bit of a generational uh, renewal where younger people are coming onto the committee, and I hope more will. Uh, and I would advocate that anyone um, join us. It's, it's quite cheap. It only costs $50 a year to be a member. But it's very important that people out there in the society who are thinking about nuclear energy and want to get a bit more information about it, come along and join the association, join the dialogue. Um, we hold about seven or eight public lectures a year at... Uh, at the Ainsley Theatre at Lucas Heights. We hold meetings together with what we call the Four Society, it's Institution of Engineers, um, and with the, the Australian Institute of Energy and the Royal Society. And we hold these uh, meetings with, for, where we can have learned speakers discuss all matters of energy and science um, for, for the audience. So it's really a science-based professional organisation for uh, improvement in knowledge and dialogue. Excellent. Yeah, I just uh, I only just recently joined up myself, and I uh, have been uh, been sworn in. So yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah. I saw your membership come across at the last meeting. <laughs> nice, nice. They decided that they uh, they decided they'd have me on, so that was all good. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so where were we? Okay, so the South Korean nuclear fleet has been of interest to the Australian Nuclear Association and to yourself, of course, uh, in particular the APR-1000 and the APR-1400 variants. Um, firstly, what are these machines? Okay. They are generically what we call pressurised water nuclear reactors. And so the APR-1000, it's an advanced version of what they call the OPR-1000. So Korea has had a very exciting rise in using nuclear energy. Uh, it goes back to the period of national reconstruction after the Korean War. Um, in the 70s, they built their very first reactor. They, in fact, it consumed about half their national debt when they wow. built their very first reactor. They, they bet the house on the on their first reactor, and and it's paid handsomely in that nation for its economic rise. Um, we see, we know the problems Australia is facing with its rising electricity tariffs. Mm. But in the period of about a 17 or 18 year duration in Korea, they've had an increase in electricity costs of about 50%. It's not been particularly high. During that period, their GDP rose 16 fold. Okay. What happens in Korea is they do not commodify electricity the way we do. They use electricity as a facilitator of economic wealth throughout their nation. And so the great lesson that we can see in nations like Korea is that you do not use electricity in the hands of corporate raiders to strangle the economy. You use it as a, a mechanism to facilitate the growth of the rest of the economy because it is really the thing that enables manufacturing and industry and commerce to occur with certainty of investment. Now, they did this by going out there and studying the various energy options. And so they built the first pressurised water reactor. And thereafter, they brought in a design from the United States <coughs> called the System 80 reactor. And that is a pressurised water thermal reactor. At that stage, I think from memory, they had about six or 700 megawatts in the very first one, megawatts output. And so then they for, built... Just for um, clarification, sort of how does that sort of compare to uh, any other sort of reactor, sort of 600, 700 watts, just for it's, people not, not familiar? It's an intermediate sized reactor. At that period, at that time, the French, for example, had built 58 reactors. Uh, their smallest size was about 900 megawatts. That was a Westinghouse design. And uh, then they uh, built, I think their next ones were about 11 or 1200 megawatts. So the six or 700 megawatt first reactors that they built were not especially large but they fitted their grid at the time and they were a good challenge. Um, then they moved on to the to reactors in the 900 megawatt category and that was the OP, OPR 1000. Um, after that, uh, they developed the APR, Advanced Pressurised Reactor 1400 and that is a 1.4 gigawatt or 1400 megawatt reactor. And they've built from memory about four of those, I think, at this stage. Um, they've got about 10 of the OPR 1000s. They've got a couple of um, heavy water reactors. And then they've got their earlier generation of six or 700 megawatt reactors. So all in up, they've got about 20 reactors, I believe, in South Korea. Um, with a mix, but the mix is evolving. Um, they then went over to the United Arab Emirates and they built 5.6 gigawatts of energy there with four of these 1400 megawatt reactors. And they built those, they started in, from memory, 2009. I think their first 
um, concrete was poured in 2012 and they've completed the first one, nearing completion on the second and they'll have all four of them knocked off by 2020. So it's been a very disciplined program in probably the hardest environment you could think of building a reactor. And I mean, the heat is intense, the dust is intense, the foundation conditions over there are horrible. It's a difficult place to build reactors, and yet they've done it in that hostile environment. If they could do it there, then we thought, well, we need them here because our That's place, this skill place, is. is a cakewalk compared to working in the United Arab Emirates. Wow. Um, look, just before I sort of move on, you mentioned OPR. Um, what does that stand for? Uh, well, it's the original pressurised reactor um, okay. that they used as opposed to the APR. What they're doing as they evolve reactors, the original reactors in that generation two group, as we'd call them, were reactors that had all analog control systems and they had levels of safety, which are steadily being enhanced. One of the enhancement methods that we see in modern reactors are issues such as putting in hydrogen recombiners. So should you get an event such as that that happened at Fukushima, where the uh, rods overheated and started to melt, the zirconium lining around or cladding around the uh, fuel rods, uh, when it gets very hot, it causes a catalytic breakdown of water into oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen uh, comes out into the atmosphere and that can cause an explosion, which is what happened to the reactor uh, buildings at Fukushima. Now, modern reactors have ways of dealing with that, of progressively burning it off or recombining it so that it does not present a danger. So that's one of the things you do in generation three reactors. Other means are you look at uh, ways of putting water into the reactors uh, in the event of a meltdown. So how do you take active measures to drive water into those reactors, unlike the issues that we saw at Fukushima, where they were unable to do that uh, in a very timely manner. So you put in place a whole bunch of regimes to be able to get water in an urgent manner into the reactors to keep them cool. Other means you look at is how can I flood the zone around the reactor pressure vessel? So I might decide through the architecture of my internals of the reactor of the power, power plant to put the pressure vessel low in the zone and I will have water elevated in things such as the, uh, <clears throat> the water storage that's used to flood the reactor compartment when I change fuel over. So I've got those reservoirs sitting inside my reactor containment and I can flood the zone with those reservoirs all around it in the event of uh, an overheating of the reactor. And so these uh, other means of controls. Now, some of those means of controls also involve what we call passive measures. So we can have an active measure whereby I positively drive a pump to drive that emergency core coolant, or I can do it by virtue of a passive means of having the water descend under set points through passive control devices. I can also look at means such as thermosiphoning of heat up and away from the reactor pressure vessel. And so then we go to the ultimate being the AP1000 reactor, the Westinghouse reactors. And if you think about the AP1000, I often think of a metaphor a bit like the uh, metal vessels that we have at a barbecue that contain propane. Now, you imagine inside such a metal vessel, if I've got a very hot element, for example, I've got a, a reactor that's overheating and I put some water around that reactor and that water boils off inside that pressure vessel, that metal pressure vessel. Now, if I then choose to 
pass water over that steel, it recondenses that water back inside the pressure vessel and that water becomes available for continued recooling of the reactor. So all of that is a passive means of keeping the reactor cool, if you like. And so you use conduction and convection through normal physical processes to enable the reactor to keep cool and you're not reliant, for example, upon pumps to do that work for you. Now, all of that's all very good with a passive cool reactor, provided you have, you are pretty darn sure over what all the events are that could enable the passive system to come into play. Um, but unfortunately, these events are not cannot always be foretold. And so ideas about having both passive and active means available, and the active means, you can use those in the event that despite your best guesses at how these events could occur, you still need something up your sleeve. And so you have active means to operate as well. So you, you can have a mix and the mix very much is what the Koreans tend to look at with their reactors, their advanced pressurised reactors. They have both active and passive means going into their design. Well, it sounds like the, um, the, the textbook definition of defence in depth. Correct. That's exactly what uh, reactors are. And your first means of defence with pressurised water reactors is, of course, the cladding going around the fuel. That's your, your first uh, level of defence, that cladding keeps the, the fuel in and away from the primary coolant circuit. And your next level of defence is <clears throat> your actual reactor pressure vessel. Then you've got your containment. And then you've got your emergency clearance zones around that. So you've got four and five and six layers of defence uh, around that uh, in the event of, of an overheating of the fuel. Excellent. So... One of the things sort of that I remember when sort of I was doing my studies, I was talking about the AP1000 and sort of studying the AP1000. It was um, very much still an application of, of existing uh, pressurised water reactors, but to me it seemed like it was streamlining the process to make them more efficient uh, and just to improve a whole lot of the safety things. Can you tell us a bit more about about what they did with the uh, the AP1000 design? Okay. Well, I'll just put up briefly a bit of an image there. So we'll put that there briefly. And what you can see is in this brown zone, that's the large steel containment that I described earlier, which is a, a bit of a metaphor I gave of something like the, uh, uh, the propane container that that's you the might have. And down here, you've got your reactor sitting very low. And the water up here that can descend over that shell to keep the thing cool, okay? Now, what they did around these structures, all of these structures here, is they developed a new method of construction for those, which they thought would streamline the construction and make them cheaper. And so instead of using the traditional concrete formed and reinforced concrete formed and pour process, they determined that they would build a sandwich panel of steel using shipbuilding techniques, bring that in and place it uh, and then backfill that with concrete. It sounded like a good way because the idea being that all of these prefabricated boxes could be placed rather quickly with very large cranes and that you could shorten the construction process. Um, I'm not sure that that has actually uh, borne the fruit in terms of low cost. Uh, to get the tolerances on that steel, to get them all made in a timely manner, uh, exceeded the ability of um, the United States steel industry to manufacture that. And in fact, those sandwiched units were made by companies such as IHI Shipbuilding, I think in Japan or in Taiwan. So they had to go offshore to get the things built. 
And so what seemed like a good idea at the time had problems in terms of reinvigorating United States industry to address the matter. Um, the reactor pressure vessel itself designed for the AP-1000, which is a, you know, a really good reactor in, in design, but from the people who actually make those pressure vessels, they've told me that it is probably the hardest reactor pressure vessel uh, there is to make. Uh, because they want to get a very long lifespan out of it and it's made to extremely tight tolerances. So a lot of the things with the AP1000, uh, they may be teething problems and in the hands of the right type of industrial economy with the right supply chain, it may work. Um, unfortunately, in the United States, it's not born fruit and this could be as much as anything, a result of what we call post-industrial economies not being able to rise to the challenge. I mean, they don't have a shipbuilding industry over there anymore. And so all of these things are uh, possibly in decline in that, in that nation. Um, it's for that reason that uh, we tend to look towards the nations of North Asia for a probable solution to the industrial construction issues of nuclear power reactors. So it's simply sort of a case that it's those, not necessarily what you call developing nations, but nations that have not developed to the same point as say in the West, that actually have those skills today that is needed to, to build these high, high tolerance structures. Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> I'll mention more about that in detail, but in, in Summary, if you take the AP-1000, we'll just go to this little graphic I've got here. Now, what the AP-1000 attempted to do, and quite correctly, is if you, if you take the last pressurised water reactor that was built in the United Kingdom with size will be, and that, that power station consumed about 500,000 cubic metres of concrete. The AP-1000 was intended to consume about 100,000 cubic metres of concrete. In other words, 20% of the amount of size will be. Um, the reinforcing bar, which was intended to be used in the AP-1000, was about uh, 12,000 tonnes. Uh, size will be had 65,000 tonnes. Again, we've got only about 20%. And yet both reactors had a similar uh, power output. Now, if I go back to that little graphic, <clears throat> size will be is that big sketch and an AP1000 is this little one. Okay. Massive difference. A massive difference. So the AP1000 is a really good idea and I'm not convinced that it can't succeed, but it does have a problem in the nation which may not have the infrastructure in place to really build them. So we go then to a nation like South Korea. We go to Doosan Heavy Industries. That's the place where the bits are made. And at Doosan Heavy Industries, we were there in May, we saw the world's largest forging press, 17,000 tonne forging press. And we watched it sit there forging part of a turbine for a... Uh, a power station. Um, at Doosan Heavy Industries, the blast furnace steel comes in and in the arc furnaces there, it's re-alloyed to make the different kinds of stainless steel and low alloy steels that are required for nuclear power reactors and steam generators and for that matter, the large crankshafts and marine diesel motors that are also built there. So. They make the steel there. They, they, they take that new alloyed steel out and they pass that over to the forging shop in about 600 tonne billets. Wow. It goes through the big forges. It's got a 13,000 tonne forge. It's got a 1,500 tonne forge. It's got a 17,000 tonne forge. And they work, they work that and they build all of the components, the, the steam generators, the reactor pressure vessels, all of those bits. Um, but Doosan doesn't just make power reactors. I mean, they build, while we were there, 
massive turbine shafts for coal-fired power stations, hydro power stations, a whole suite of power stations. They build the world's largest crankshafts for huge uh, ocean-going vessels. Giant diesel engines are manufactured there for very large sea-going vessels. So it's a diverse industry. And what you find out when you go to a workshop like that and you come out absolutely gobsmacked by the fact that when you want to build this stuff, it's an art as well as a science, as well as engineering. The art of not getting inclusions in the forgings, the art of getting the right stress relief in the forgings, all of the ways of achieving the integrity of the castings and the forgings they make, there are decades of skills resident in that type of facility. And so you come away with a profound respect for what is required to build large power stations, be they coal, be they nuclear, be they anything. You've got to protect the industrial base of your nation, and that's what Korea has been able to do. Japan is also able to do that. China's able to do that. Um, the remnants of the French industry at Le Creuseau is able to do that. Uh, the Russians are able to do that. But you've got to keep that solid industrial metalliferous and uh, forging capability within your economy. Yeah, I mean... It's it's kind of embarrassing when you think about it. I mean, just our automotive manufacturing industry in South Australia has collapsed. I mean, that was just yes. building cars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are becoming very much passive nations. Uh, we are price takers on our exports and uh, we are technology takers on anything that's brought in. I'll just get rid of this call. Sorry. No, I might have to edit this out, mate. You mentioned forge pressing. Um, I actually don't know what that is. Is that a bit like plastic inje injection molding, but ramped no, up massively for steel? Nothing like it. All right, tell me about that. Okay. If you imagine you've got a big hunk of steel, okay, and you've just taken it out of the electric arc furnace and it's, it's sitting there at about 1,100 degrees centigrade, so is that red and hot? Is it Red hot. No, yep. We're talking about above red hot. This thing's orange hot. Yep. Okay. And it comes across to the forging shop. And while it's curling, it's getting beaten into the shape. So it's very much a plastic material. It's not, um, it, it's, it's steadily taken from a billet into the shape you want by pressing by forging this thing, hitting it with a bloody great hammer. And you will pass a mandrel through that plastic material to make your cylinder. So you're using a process of driving mandrels through this stuff and hitting the thing with these large presses to create round cylinders um, or into long, um, shafts that you then subsequently machine. So the process is not extrusion. Well, it is a kind of extrusion, but it's pretty much like the blacksmith. Only you're putting big machinery, you start with a bit of hot metal and you are beating it into the shape that you want. And this <coughs> process creates very strong metal because of the alignment of the grain structure as you as you forge it and force it into the shape hereafter. Okay. It's amazing. So, yeah, it's basically ancient, you know, medieval blacksmithing, you know, guys yeah, with bloody sledgehammers. Quite, but no, it's true. all automated now. It's all massive machines to, well, to do it on much. It's not automated. So, imagine, I mean, very much these large machines at that level have got control rooms and operators and people directing the process on the right. floor, on the shop floor, um, directing the process as it occurs. Yeah. Wow. That's all, that, that sounds like... But it like goes from thing. even that, it then goes, uh, the reactor pressure vessels are weighing in at two or 300 tonnes, and so they have a low alloy steel, and 
and then in various parts of the reactor pressure vessel or the steam generator, they then subsequently line those with stainless steel. And so you might, the ones that we saw there in particular, I was looking at a steam generator, the steam generator being the device that's in the primary coolant circuit, it's the interface between the hot water coming out of the reactor and the secondary circuit, which is the water that goes through the turbine. And the interface is where the heat out of the primary circuit goes into the secondary circuit. And so it's very much like this big coiled up bunch of tubing that sits within another big tube device called the steam generator. And that's where you manufacture the steam that goes into the turbine. And so that structure in itself starts off as a low alloy steel, but then it has linings, two, two linings of uh, different alloys of stainless steel. And then that is machined. And so it's, it's going through a whole bunch of processes to turn out the final steam generator or the reactor pressure vessel itself. Certainly sounds like something that deserves a, a video in itself or a podcast it, in itself. It is. It's, it's definitely, and the Koreans <clears throat> are quite welcoming and we need more people to go over there and view this and get a fuller appreciation for what we're talking about, yes. Yeah, wow. That's amazing. Okay, so these reactors, these APR 1400s and APR 1000s, do you see a, a place in Australia for this technology? I see the place in Australia emerging most urgently. <clears throat> we started off this discussion today talking about what motivated me to do this. And the motivation comes out of the need to address climate change. <clears throat> climate change will not affect my life particularly severely. I'm 67 and I'll be boxed and buried sometimes in the next 20 years. My eight grandchildren and my three children will be severely affected. <clears throat> the way the world is going at present my eight young grandchildren will be lucky to have the lifespan that you and I are going to have. We need to be quite aware that the world is going to be a much more difficult place for these kids. And it's in our hands to do something about this. <clears throat> At present in Australia, we have a bunch of coal-fired power stations. We've got about 20 gigawatts of coal power sitting in Australia at present. We've got an even bigger problem with the gas. People think that gas is a solution. Gas is not a solution. <clears throat> gas, particularly the open cycle gas turbines, they're putting out about four or 500 grams of carbon for every kilowatt, um, kilowatt hour. The coal is putting out the best part of a thousand grams and you guys down in Victoria are putting it out with about 1200 grams. Oh yeah, brown coal brown is coal. dirty even by coal standards. Yeah, even by coal standards, bad news. <clears throat> if you've got 3% lost methane, then you end up by virtue of the amount of uh, greenhouse gas activity of unburned methane, you end up with emissions about as bad as a coal power station out of a gas turbine. So you've got to really control your losses. In the United States, over the Marcellus oil shale fields, they've got satellites there indicating that they're getting emission losses of around about 7 or 8%. Gas is not a solution. Gas is actually an entrapment. Wow. The thing that really entraps gas is wind power. The intermittent and totally unplanned nature of, of wind power in particular means that for every wind power station you build, you are obligated to put in an amount of, of gas to back it up. It's axiomatic. 
It's a great business opportunity under the renewable energy targets to build wind, and it's a great opportunity for outfits like AGL to build gas to back that up. It's a marriage made in heaven if you're under a corporation, but it's not fixing climate change. So what we need to do in respect of our, um, our, our fossil fuels is we need in particular to be looking at replacing the coal power plants with um, nuclear power. Now I'm going to show you another brief graphic and we'll have a look at this one. And what this graphic shows in the blue line coming down here, that's the retirement of all our existing coal powered plants in Australia. And what we've got here on this rising red line is what we could do to replace that lost 20 gigawatts of coal with 20 gigawatts of nuclear. Now, <clears throat> to give you a bit of a time frame, it's thought that that 20 gigawatts of coal will all drop out generally by around about 2045-2050. The French built 58 reactors with 63 gigawatts of power, okay? Three times the Australian demand and they built that over a 22 year period. And they built that, get this, before the advent of personal computers into the workplace. That's insane. They did it between the 1970s and 1990s. Wow. It, it to me, is one of the marvels, the industrial marvels of the Industrial Revolution that they managed to achieve that. Um, <clears throat> I've seen those reactors, I've been through them. Now, what I'm talking about here is that we in Australia could be building about 18 to 20 gigawatts and we need to be doing that quite quickly. We could do it between now and something like 2042, all right? We could do it over a similar 20 year period, but our productivity would only need to be about a third of what the French had. And you gotta remember, this was a nation that had been belted around in the Second World War. And we're not a nation that was as, va as advanced as ours is at present. So we need to really consider replacing our coal power plants with nuclear power plants, and we could do that. And it would provide a phenomenal number of jobs. It would provide around about six and a half thousand jobs for about two decades, all right? Many hundreds of millions of man hours would be consumed in it, and it would be a new industrial base for Australia. <clears throat> Australia could do this because unlike using solar or wind, where our industrial input is, is, is extends really under the opening cardboard boxes that arrive off ships, we could actually be an integral part of the system. Now, this graph, this image I'm going to show you here, this shows the types of things that Westinghouse could see happening in Australia. All of the green zone that's what you call the low skills base. The mid zone is the medium skills and the red zone up here is the high skills base of using and of building a nuclear power reactor. Now in those high skills base, that's about 14% of the actual commodities in the reactor. Uh, are those areas where Australia possibly will never need to play a game, okay? In the medium zones, that's about 25%. And the low risk is about 61%. So there's about 86% of a nuclear power plant could be built in Australia if we chose to pull our fingers out and get on with the job. And once again, take charge of our nation's destiny. That's the sort of thing we need to be doing. It's in terms of labour and 
and, and engineering and skills input, the percentages are similar. In fact, the high, risk, uh, the high skills base is only about 11% of the man hours. And the medium and low is about 89%. And we could choose to have any percentage up to about 89%. If we got really ambitious, sure, we could get a forging press in and we could do that ourselves as well. But, you know, while the capacity is sitting there in the nations of Korea in Doosan heavy industries, you'd have to ask yourself why you do that. But it is the potential for phenomenal economic and industrial renewal in Australia. And you've got to remember, this is not a money sucking operation. The power that you get out of these reactors powers the rest of our economy and people pay for it. It's not like building submarines. It's not like building jet aircraft. That's a hole to pump money down. We've got to defend our nation. But nuclear power reactors would power our nation for the best part of a century. I mean, these things, their first licensing is 60 years, and thereafter the second licensing takes them out to 80 or 100. So we're talking about a century asset for our nation. And a hundred years is a type of thing that our time. nation needs to commit to. Mm. Yeah, it's, I mean, a lot can, I mean, I, I can't, uh, sometimes think like a hundred years, like what is that? I think you look back a hundred years ago, what was happening a hundred years ago? We were just finishing up the First World War. Um, you have a fleet like this, like your energy is done, you're set you're all done. Years. It's Your a, um... energy is done, yes. Yeah. I mean, and that's... you get on and you use that energy. But the other thing you've done is you've created a system, going back to what the Koreans did, is having committed to that power, you then go on and you build other industry. And you give your aluminium smelters and your all your smelters, all your other petrochemicals, all those other industries have a surety in investment. At present, we know that there is no nation in the world that has powered our economy, its economy using intermittent renewables. No one has done it. The closest that's tried is Germany, and they're still sitting on about four or 500 grams CO2 per kilowatt hour, they're still at around about 10 or 12 times France. And they're not, there's no indication they're going to get below, not while they're building now another or even more uh, gas pipelines in from Russia. So the solution is not down that route. There is no surety in terms of the industrial future of your nation, even your commercial future of your nation, if you're going down that route because that is an experiment into, into the unknown. You're playing with your, your nation's future without any surety of knowing where you're going with it. You know proof positive in the laboratory of real life that France, Sweden, Belgium, Switzerland have all done this and they all got the emissions outputs to prove that it can be done. The emissions output map uh, available online. It's a. Uh, it's quite sobering to look at us. We know the website. We all mm. look at it, don't we? Oh yeah, it's good value. It's good fun. Yeah. Right on. All right then. Congratulations on your election win, Prime Minister Parker. Please outline your nuclear power implementation policy. And it's okay. not that crazy now because we just got a new Prime Minister yesterday. And I was so pleased. I got a call last night and our new Deputy Prime Minister, apparently in his very first speech to the Australian people, Josh Frydenberg, the boy from Kuyong, and you better find, and I'll leave it to you to try and find this because I can't find the film clip. Right. But I got the call that in his very first talk, he mentioned nuclear energy for Australia. I'll have to look this up. So we need to look for the film clip. So what would we do? Okay, from what we've learned in South Korea and from the success cases around the world, the French, the Swiss, the Swedes, all of these, nuclear energy does not happen successfully 
in general without strong government backing. There is a very good 14 point plan that we have seen, the 14 lessons learned by the Korean industry. And amongst those issues, very first cab off the rank, what I would do as a Prime Minister is I would immediately start a dialogue with the Australian people to work out what we were going to do with the used fuel coming out of those reactors. You do not leave it to the end, you look at it right from day one. So you have a plan for what you're going to do with your used nuclear fuel. Now it may be what the, what the, what the Chinese are looking at doing is ultimately having a fast reactor program to burn that. So we could go to the, um, the fast reactors, the sodium cooled fast reactors, or we could burn it up in uh, liquid salt reactors. There are a number of options, and these are things that I looked at at ANU. And they're great options, but they're in the future. The climate change challenge is a near and present danger that can only be actually resolved in the short term by pressurised water reactors or boiling water reactors if we want to go existing down Existing technology. But existing technology is there to do it. We know the price. We went to South Korea, we saw the reactors being built, we know the price and we've worked out a price for Australia, okay, for these reactors. The next thing we need to do is in government buy-in, we do not need to shackle the Australian people with a lot of borrowed money from too much private enterprise at high interest rates. The Australian people need to buy in with this and we need to be looking at our superannuation funds, our accumulated funds within Australia to buy into this. We're talking probably for the reactor fleet, I'm thinking about 125, $130 billion region. That's the type of money we're looking at. That's Australia? We're in Australia. Right. No, as in, in Australian dollars. In Australian dollars. Half of those roughly would probably be built in New South Wales, uh, probably somewhat less in Victoria and some in the south of Queensland. And, um, terrific resources so that we can maximise the use of our existing 500 kV power lines. We've got to use the resources we've got and the existing cooling facilities available, for example, in the La Trobe Valley or on coastal lo locations such as Portland where the aluminium smelter is in Victoria. We've got to be looking at areas in New South Wales in the, in the Hunter region around the existing cooling facilities. We've got to try to build as many as them we can nearby the 500 kV and on coastlines to maximise the use of seawater cooling. So we've got, we can, we can site the reactors fairly quickly. When you say near existing cooling facilities, are these things like the cooling towers that you get on any thermal power station? Yes, but the cooling facility or resource being the water. Okay, right. <clears throat> it's unlikely that you would be able to utilise existing cooling towers. Um, they're old technology. You would probably be bulldozing them and restarting. Okay. But the existing facilities that you would take the maximum advantage of would be the water resource for cooling, the railway, the roads and the 500 kV networks or build them nearby so that the extension to those 500 kV networks wasn't too large. But you've got to try to maximise that. Unlike what the renewable fraternity are looking at doing is building out massively extended grid networks. Now, the reason I harp on about transmission is this. Currently of every power bill we've got, the generation component is only about 24% of the bill. We're looking upwards of 50%, 60% is the transmission and distribution components. Okay. Is this an aspect specific to Australia since we are such a large geographic area with such a small spread out population? Yes, it is one of the things. If you go to Korea, 
South Korea, 20 reactors, about half the size of Victoria. And I think they've got about 60 million people or something like that. Their population density is 500 people per square kilometre. Ours is three. Oh, okay. wow. So Australia's got the most extensive grid in the world per capita compared to nations like Korea. So for them, grid enhancement is no big deal. For us, it's a really big deal, and that's why we need to be very cautious about where we put these things. But not only that, a nuclear power reactor operates at upwards of 90% capacity factor. A wind farm could be sitting down at 25%, or if you're lucky, you might get up to 40% in some of the best locations. A PV system will be sitting down at around 25% or 20%, depending on where it is. <clears throat> now, that might be all right for just the generator if it's built cheaply enough. But the grid that connects to it is also therefore operating at those low capacity factors, as is the substation that's connected to it, as is every bit down the food chain from the generator. And it's this underutilised grid, which is where the money's going. And if you remember what I said earlier, we're paying about double the price of the generation now, just for transmission and networks, compared to generation. If we go and pull that stunt with intermittent renewables, that's where the big costs are. We're just it generating matter. electricity to just PV burn it on the could, transmission grid. PV could be free. You could give it away in boxes of cornflakes, but the system cost would still be greater than nuclear energy. Crazy. That's the issue we've got to look at. Now, we're probably coming towards the end of this, but I'll, I'll show you the impact of what I'm talking about for the nation's future. <clears throat> I, with my colleagues, Dr. Robert Parr and Mr. Barry Hill, when we went to Korea, to have a look at what they build. We came back and Robert Barr put together a model and we've used that model to create a chart like this one. This is what we call the system levelized cost of energy. So along the bottom axis, we've got here, the amount of nuclear or renewables going from zero to 100% going into our grid system. And up here, we've got the cost in dollars per megawatt hour on the vertical axis. All the nuclear solutions are these lines down here. That's their relative cost. And the lines represent the different discount rate we put to those systems, going from 3% of the bottom up to 12%. Likewise, on the renewables, we go from 3% up to 12% on those. That's why you've got a spread of answers. And what we're seeing on that, and over here we've got the existing costs of our system with our existing system, okay? So nuclear power will be dearer than our current system. At, uh, but it won't be so much dearer to break the bank. Renewables, if we try to get to those levels, we're talking, for, for example, a system levelized cost of nuclear at around about um, $100 uh, for the same degree of input in renewables will be up around $300. It's going to be about three times dearer if you tried to do it with renewable energy compared to nuclear. But one of the reasons we're in this game is for the cost of carbon abatement. We're trying to get carbon out of the system. And so I'll go to this graph. Up here, we've got the dollars per tonne to abate carbon. So just uh, let me interject. When we're talking about abatement, we're talking about like carbon capture and sequestr sequestration technologies? No. No, it's different. Abatement means if I want to drive carbon out of the system compared to now. So I know that at present, my electricity on the NEM <coughs> is generating about 830 grams 
of carbon dioxide per tonne, per kilowatt hour. And abatement means that if I want to spend some money to reduce that <clears throat> from 830 to 80, I want to reduce or abate the amount, how much is that going to cost me to get that reduction? That's what I mean by abatement. <clears throat> if I'm going to do it with nuclear, and I want, and I accept the point that nuclear is going to be more expensive than coal, okay? It will be. <clears throat> if I use nuclear, that reduction per tonne for the different in investment rates, so we've got going along here, we've got the percentage sitting in the NEM, the energy generated from zero to 100%. And up here, we've got how many dollars per tonne does it cost me to get rid of carbon? If I use nuclear energy at around about 6% discount rate, it's going to cost me around about 20 bucks a tonne, 20 to 23 dollars a tonne to get rid of carbon. If I try to use renewable, it's going to follow this curve. Okay, that curve there. Right. And at 6%, we see it's going to cost anywhere from 150 a 20% renewables right up to about $300 at about 90% renewables. So in other words, I can compare $300 with around about $22 with nuclear. And the game is to get rid of carbon. The game is not, there's no other game. Well, there is the game is to get reliable energy for the, for the country's economic well-being, but you want to do it in a clean environment. So nuclear wins that, that game hands down. And that's the way we've got to be looking. So as the Prime Minister of Australia, I'd be looking at how I can borrow money so much cheaply from the Australian people and put that money into the future for this country for 100 years and get that money back to the Australian people through wealth creation, through the building of 18 to 20 gigawatts of nuclear power. Doesn't stop there. After we've built that 18 gigawatts to replace the coal power plants, we keep building reactors, maybe another six or seven, to power our motor vehicles, to get rid of all that imported petrol and diesel and put it into our light car fleet with electric vehicles, okay? If not electric vehicles, we could even use uh, ammonia, all right, or hydrogen. We've got all those options that we need to be looking at. I've recently, I think just in the last couple of days, saw a press release or a video released by CSIRO talking about the the hydrogen they've found and actually finding a way to combine it with ammonia as a very stable method for transport. Yeah. And I think, yeah. yeah, this is fantastic. This is really great. Well, this How is where we need your hydrogen. This is where we need the electricity out of the nuclear power plants to power our future of electric vehicles. But we've got to remember, we also get a strategic benefit. We're no longer therefore reliant upon imported petroleum products from the Middle East. Mm. We then need to be able to drive electricity into more areas of our economy, into our heavy transport fleets. We need to be able to put more electricity into our trains rather than having those rattly old diesel sets going out of Melbourne, out of Spencer Street, all the way up to Albury. We've got to get rid of those and we've got to electrify those lines. We've got to electrify the main lines coming down to Victoria from New South Wales and take, doing the same up to, Victor, up to Queensland. So we've got to get our main lines electrified and start driving diesel out of those areas and into, in, in, into our transport sectors. So there are whole areas of our industrial, uh, commercial areas where we've got to look at increased electricity use. Just 
as a point maybe just to offer another opportunity one of the things i find very interesting and look this is further down the track these are sort of sort of gen 4 designs but the very high temperature reactors and the reactors design where they can do things like process heat could you for argument's sake instead of electrifying you know our rail network or our you know rural or you know remote rail networks could you look at options where you actually have hydrogen fuel as a replacement for your diesel electric locomotives uh, <clears throat> there is more hydrogen in ammonia than in hydrogen. Okay. Okay. You need the carrier for hydrogen. That's ammonia. The, 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 the chemical reaction to derive the benefit of the hydrogen-oxygen reaction to give you energy, which is what you're after. There's more of that in ammonia per weight, unit weight, than in hydrogen itself. Hydrogen is a beast of a material to transport. Hydrogen will go through every porous surface it can find. You can't seal it. It's a difficult transport operation. We need to be looking at how we use ammonia as the transport device and whether you directly combust the ammonia or whether you convert it as CSIRO or looking at into hydrogen for use through fuel cells, well, that's another mechanism. But the game is to be able to produce ammonia probably through high temperature reactors uh, as a means. Right. It's not the only way. You could even use, if you had enough PWRs, you could use electrolytic means to generate the hydrogen as well. There are a number of me methods to do it. But they all stem back to the fact that you need that power, be it thermal or be it electrical, and at the moment we're doing that with coal. That's right. But there's no substitute for high energy density. The idea that we've currently got in Australia of people advocating the conversion of low density dis separated in, in energy with 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 low quality, like wind and solar, is using an exhaustive amount of materials, huge amounts of materials to gather up this stuff, to put it down transmission lines with very poor capacity factors, with gear that will wear out very quickly. You're only going to get, if you're lucky to get 15 years out of a PV system, you'll be lucky to get, you might get, I think in Denmark, the average lifespan of a wind turbine is 17 years. You know, you're going to keep replacing these things all the time. We need to get a more robust, efficient use of resources to get a low environmental footprint, to not be industrialising our landscapes with these devices so that we can actually use fewer materials more efficiently with a high energy density and get efficiency out of the whole system. That's what we need to be looking at. Yeah, definitely. Oh, absolutely fascinating. Um, okay, look, a lot of the questions I've sort of uh, meant to ask have sort of been covered now, but um, let's see. Look, last couple of sort of questions before we finish up. Um, so, sort of carbon capture and carbon sequestration technologies. What's the sort of practicality of those for our existing coal, uh, coal generation? For existing Intent? coal generation, none. None. No. Okay. Zero. For new coal generation, it's possible, but that would require new coal power plants. So it's a and new coal build power plant. New coal power plants, these high efficiency ones, are churning out <clears throat> efficiencies of around about 45% compared to about the 30s, the low 30s for our current ones. But they're still generating carbon emissions. So you've got to build new coal power plants and then you've got to pipe that stuff and somehow liquefy the stuff. So you're going to be losing massive amounts of energy in driving that carbon to its, to its point of disposal. You're also going to be losing energy at the flue to be able to consolidate the stuff. So your efficiencies on your coal power plants are going to go down dramatically while you consume energy 
to try and get that stuff to to the repository and then you've got to find that place to me it's it's a poor solution um, to the nuclear option um, but people try but I um, I wrestle with it I, I just it doesn't resonate as an engineering solution compared to uh, nuclear energy it's it's kind of funny it's kind of you th people say oh nuclear energy too expensive too complicated to but yet we look at these other options people say ccs and it's actually just another ball game in a dog chasing its tail complexity oh again. it's a really complex technology compared to a nuclear power reactor a nuclear power you say what a nuclear power reactor is in itself is not that complex a device. I mean, I've walked, I've gone into uh, nuclear fuel facilities. I've walked right up to nuclear fuel rods where they're making them. I mean, it's not that big a deal of, of, of building this stuff. I, I come back to the example, the French did 58 reactors in the 1970s and got them all going before PCs hit the workplace. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, you know, people need to get this in perspective. It, it's, it's not that complex. There are more complex nuclear processes than nuclear power reactors. Yeah, right, definitely. Mm. Yeah, cool. All righty. So, yeah, look, anti-nuclear rhetoric, it used to be about weapons, proliferation, waste, destruction of the environment, and fear of radiation. Now the main concern seems to be cost. Now, you can call me an op optimist, but I think that's progress. How would you say that the discussion has changed, you know, in the community? Um, there is an extremely strong anti-group in Australia on nuclear. We're seeing that being played out right now. Uh, with the low level nuclear waste repository they're trying to get built at Kimber or Kimber's the first cab off the rank. We're seeing um, Aboriginal communities being harnessed to oppose it. Um, the debate uses every, it re they really make up factoids to prevent it being disposed of. I've been through the low level waste repository at Lucas Heights. We're talking about 44 gallon drums of stuff that people walk past every day without any shielding. This well, just material is of no issue. And yet we're finding we can't even build a repository for that stuff. So we don't want to underestimate the people who oppose that in the community and will use every devious argument in the book against it. Most of the arguments they use are without foundation, yet they harness fear very effectively. Oh, yeah. Just um, for those people who might be unfamiliar with some of the terms, um, when you talk about low-level nuclear waste, what is that and how does that compare to medium and high, uh, high nuclear waste? Okay. Low level nuclear. Okay. The definitions <clears throat> are roughly this that low level and intermediate do not produce excessive amounts of heat. Okay. Intermediate produces some heat, um, but it's in general, it's, it's able to sustain itself with natural air convection around it. The heat comes from the decay of fission products within the fuel. So the materials we've got, for example, coming out of the Opal reactor and the previous HIFA reactors at Lucas Heights, <clears throat> they contain the remnant materials of the fission process. And so the intermediate waste that's sitting now in a 
large container at Lucas Heights came out of those high fire reactors and it was reprocessed in France and sent back to Australia. And the main material that's producing reactivity out of that is old, as used fission products such as cesium. Okay. The intermediate waste is contained within a shielded material and that intermediate waste has also been put into a glass material, 150 litre containers, uh, and about 20 of them in that container, in that cask. And that material, if you took those small containers out, would give people lethal levels of radiation. So it's quite radioactive, but inside the shielded large container, it presents no risk to anybody. I think I've seen Low. it. It's like, it looks like a big coffee cup almost. Well, no, it's, it's actually a big round beige coloured cylinder. Weighs about 100 tonnes. It's about, from memory, eight metres high and about three metres in diameter. Yeah, that's the one. Okay. Oh, you're right. Coffee cup being the fluted side. Yeah, yes. that's the one. Okay. Um, low level waste is currently stored in 44 gallon drums. It is the used beakers, the used clothing, the smocks, the aprons, um, and some small innocuous materials that came out of laboratory processes. That material has got probably some remnant fission products on it, which gives rise to its radioactivity. It's stored in containers and its radioactive levels are measured. It might even be old metal components, valves or pipes that were in the processes. It's stored in racks in an industrial shed at uh, Lucas Heights and a chap with a driving a forklift in normal clothing operates in that shed. I think the current work has been there for about six years and he operates there daily and he see, receives no <coughs> level of radiation beyond that that a normal industrial worker is allowed to achieve. High level nuclear waste, on the other hand, is also stored in those similar containers, but it produces so much radioactivity, it needs cooling. In its first form, when it's taken out of the reactors, it's put into use into fuel ponds. And that fission breakdown heats up those ponds. And so the, the heat comes out of those ponds by virtue of convection and radi radiation of infrared out of the ponds as they cool down. After about three or four decades in those ponds, it's then put into dry cast storage in outdoor areas where it still receives some positive cooling. So it takes a number of decades for that stuff to cool down so that it can be reprocessed. Now, this high level so, waste, this is typically the actual fuel elements, yeah? It's the fuel elements out of the reactors or, or some very heavily uh, bombarded material, maybe things like the uh, structure around the reactor. But in general, we're talking about the used fuel rods. And so at some stage, number of decades, that material is then reprocessed into glass forms in France or into uh, materials in Ansto, into rock forms, where it can then go into intermediate storage. So it takes a number of decades to get to that level. So high level waste is quite radiotoxic and it is also uh, heat producing. So it is a difficult material to handle right? Okay, for a number of decades. Now I might say, uh, uh, just sort of trying to remember here, as far as I know, we actually don't have any high level waste in Australia. Is that correct? Um, I would think that the used fuel rods that come out of those reactors. Um, it is stated by the government there isn't any high level waste. <clears throat> I would have thought used fuel elements coming out of reactors are high level waste until they're reprocessed. Okay. And we hold on to them and because we have an agreement, I believe, with the French that they reprocess yeah. a lot of our fuel. Yeah. So we technically have it before yeah. we send it off to them for them to reprocess and then they send it back to us saying, so, okay, here's the intermediate level material that you contracted to yeah. manage. In my, in, in my interpretation it would be, but I may be incorrect, I'm not 
the nuclear physicist at the level that the people at ANSTO are. So I could be corrected on my comment there. But a used fuel element out of a reactor prior to reprocessing is, partic is still generating heat yep. and high levels of radioactivity. Okay, fair enough. So when we talk about the low-level waste, we're talking about the tools, the smocks, the beakers. This is the material that we're talking about at Kimber. Correct. And it, it is material that has never, it, it has gotten no impact whatsoever on, on uh, people. And it would be stored above ground or at near surface and concrete encased um, forever. It, and it cannot possibly cause any contamination to um, the population or to the environment. The other thing they want to store at Kimber, I believe, is a temporary storage for the intermediate level waste container. And uh, that material can, will only ever be consigned to a deeper level of geological repository, which might be at hundreds of metres down in granite or something like that, when Australia gets such a facility. This was the finding of the South Australian Nuclear Fuel Cycle Royal Commission. Well, they, they their discussed. finding recommended that we look at <clears throat> deep geological repositories of a commercial nature to help the rest of the world resolve its high-level nuclear waste problem. And so the, the, the solutions or the facility looked at for Kimber is not what the nuclear, uh, what the... Uh, Nuclear Fuel Cycle Royal Commission was looking at. They were looking at a totally different concept for a different purpose. Yep, for a different Kimber, waste. Kimber or is for a near surfacing for an innocuous material that cannot possibly cause any harm to the general population and for a temporary storage for intermediate level waste, which at some time in the future may have to go, will have to go underground. Uh, at some depth, when at some time in the future, people, Australia's resolved where that intermediate waste level storage facility will be. I see. Very good. So, advocates for renewables are often anti-nuclear. How does the pro-nuclear crowd uh, crowd typically view renewables? How do you find that? Okay. In respect of the solutions we're looking at, even when we get to 81% of nuclear. Now, <clears throat> we're looking at, if you imagine, um, the daily spike. Our low demand period every day occurs in the evening. All right, that's, and below that low demand period is what we call base load power, okay? And below that, that point is 82% of the energy that we use on the NEM. Okay, so 18% of the energy that we use is in those daily spikes from the evening up to the daily max and back down to the next evening, okay? In those periods, our investigation indicates that we could be looking at using solar PV plus pumped hydro plus some open cycle gas in that 18% zone, okay? The reason we can't use all PV is because the sun doesn't shine after around about three or four in the afternoon, it ceases to become effective. And so you've got to get yourself through the evening period. And the evening period is when you'd, you'd be using your pump storage or you would be using your gas. The more pump storage we could get into the grid, the less would be the need to use gas. And so at present, we're looking at emissions intensities because of that residual amount of gas of around about 50 to 60 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. But we could get below that if we could get more pump storage. So there's definitely a place or a role for renewables it's just impractical to think that it's going to be 100% or Correct. anything approximate. There is, there is a role at around about, possibly in a, uh, 
probably about five or six percent of renewables coming out of PV going into those daily peaks, right. and mix that with the gas, or uh, maybe up maybe up to to ten percent of the material it could be PV going into those daily peaks. Right. But I think that's fair enough. Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a good resource provided you've got enough wind. Oh, no, sorry, not wind. Uh, provided you've got enough. Um, pump storage. Oh, and hydro is the other one. Of that 18%, of course, you've got about 8% is uh, is your snowy hydro. So you pull the 8% off your 18%, you're back down around 10%. So you could probably split your gas and your PV up to about 5% equal and knock the PV back, uh, knock, knock the gas back um, if you could increase the amount of pump storage. What would you say to our younger listeners that are interested in this technology? <clears throat> are you talking here about professional or are you talking about advocacy? Um, people that, you know, maybe, maybe they're at school, maybe they're wondering what to do with their lives, what to choose as a career. Then maybe they're listening to this and they think it's interesting. What would you... We have young Australian engineers now working overseas on nuclear power projects. Okay. If we take the advice of people such as Dr. James Hansen, there will be no solution to climate change without nuclear energy. People say it's the nuclear option. It's not the nuclear option, it's the nuclear imperative. We've got to get this option off the line. It's not the option, it's the imperative. We'll not do it with renewables because we will not be able to back them up sufficiently and, and our economy won't sustain it. I believe we're either going to have climate change or we're going to have nuclear energy. On that basis, I would encourage young people going into a career to go and get boned up on science and engineering and embrace it. And if that means that in the early parts of their career, they have to seek a career overseas to get a bit, bit more experience, go for it. I would also encourage younger people who may be now graduates to go and look at the KEPCO International Nuclear Graduate School down near the Shinkori reactors near Busan in Korea and think about doing a course there on nuclear power engineering. So there are a number of places to do it. Uh, so I would encourage people to do it. You would be ballsy, you would be sticking your neck out, but everything I am learning tells me that it's the nuclear imperative. We've got to do it. Last chance to promote the Australian Nuclear Association before we leave. Where and where, do you, where and when do you meet? Well, we meet at Ansto. We meet about six times, seven times a year. But I would also suggest that younger people and prospective members also take heart, but particularly younger people, look at the Students for Nuclear at University of New South Wales, the University of New South Wales website. Lillian Caruana is heading up that group. We've got a meeting with them next week. So for younger people seeing this, get active, have a look at that, what that student group are starting to do. There are, there are also groups for um, young people in nuclear energy. There is a very, very active group of women in nuclear based at ANSTO. And for the, to join us, for people who want to come along and join us, and I would really advocate, we need to see some people in Melbourne, in particular, looking at putting together a chapter of the ANA in Melbourne, because there are a tremendous industrial base in Melbourne and a number of people that could perhaps form a chapter of the ANA down there so we could share, share our resources. So we need to do more of this. We've got one in South Australia, 
but, but Melbourne would be a great place to get one going. Um, Ian Hall Lacey, who's been the stalwart of the World Nuclear Association, lives in Melbourne. Um, and we need to get a bit more active down there. But otherwise, come along and join us. Look at the Australian Nuclear Association website uh, for the times and places of meeting. Uh, come along to the four societies meetings as well. And in the intervening period, I'd put a plug in for my website, which is www.nuclearclimate.com.au and have a look at that, where I'm continuing to blog and roll out a plan for Australia for nuclear energy. Robert Parker, thank you very much for being on the podcast. And thanks for taking this initiative uh, and getting this going. It's, it's great to see people doing what you're doing and, and getting amongst this and taking the initiative. So thanks, thanks for what you're doing and helping us with it. No problem. Okay. Going Fishing would like to thank Robert Parker one last time for appearing on the podcast. His website is at www.nuclearforclimate.com.au. The Australian Nuclear Association website is at www.nuclearaustralia.org.au. The KEPCO International Nuclear Graduate School website can be found at www.kings.com. .ac.kr The electricity map can be found at www.electricitymap.org Thank you for watching. Links are in the description. The next episode is an interview with Daniel Zavatiero, who is the Managing Director of Uranium at the Minerals Council of Australia.